Have you ever been disappointed? In this imperfect world, we will experience many disappointments. Revelation 10, picture the disappointment of people that incorrectly interpret the prophecy. Francois will now tell us more about chapter 10 of Revelation. While I was preparing this lecture, I prayed earnestly that God would help me to convey this very important message in an acceptable and understandable manner. And also pray that he would enlighten your mind as you will be listening. May both you and I receive a rich blessing. In our previous lecture, we studied the messages of the six trumpets. We discovered that they are symbolic of war and judgment. But before John tells us about the seventh trumpet, the last one, he gives us some very important information in chapters 10 and 11. Let's start with Revelation chapter 10 verses 1 and 2. Then I saw another mighty angel coming down from heaven. He was robed in a cloud with a rainbow above his head. His face was like that of the sun. His legs were like fiery pillars. He was holding a little scroll which lay open in his hand. He planted his right foot on the sea and his left foot on the land. Before we proceed, we must first ascertain who this angel is. Let's look at his characteristics. First of all, he's robed in a cloud. And then it says, there is a rainbow above his head. His face is like the sun, and his legs are like fiery pillars. Where should we look for an explanation of these symbols? There is only one safe interpreter, and that is the Bible. The rule should always be that the Bible must interpret itself. Let's examine the meaning of the word cloud. In Revelation 1 verse 7 it says that Jesus will come with the clouds. So the angel in chapter 10 is Jesus himself. What about the rainbow? Let's read from Revelation 4 verse 3. And the one who sat there had the appearance of Jasper and Carnelian. A rainbow resembling an emerald encircled the throne. This heavenly vision of Jesus must have been tremendously captivating for John. While on earth he saw Jesus as a humble teacher, but now he sees him in his divine glory. In another description of Jesus in Revelation 1.16 it says, His face was like the sun shining in all its brilliance. The greatest study in the entire world is the study of Jesus Christ, the God-man. In this vision, we see him as the angel of the angels. Revelation chapter 10 verse 6, And he swore by him who lives forever and ever, who created the heavens and all that is in them, the earth and all that is in it, and the sea and all that is in it, and said, There will be no more delay. Do you recognize the creation language of the Old Testament in this specific verse? Where in the Bible do we find a similar description of God as the Creator? Only in Exodus chapter 20 verses 8 to 11. John is referring to the Sabbath of the fourth commandment, which is the only commandment that identifies God as the Creator of heaven and earth. From now on, John repeatedly refers to the Sabbath. The reason? The emergence of the theory of evolution at this time. John is also referring to Michael, which is mentioned in Daniel chapter 12. We've read in Revelation 10, 6 that the angel, which is Christ, swore by him who lives forever and ever. Now let's turn to Daniel chapter 12 and discover some amazing similarities between Michael and the angel of Revelation 10. Daniel 12, verses 1 to 3. At that time, Michael, the great prince who protects your people, will arise. Who is this Michael? It is Christ. The name means the one like God. There will be a time of distress such as has not happened from the beginning of the nations until then. But at that time your people, everyone whose name is found written in the book, will be delivered. Multitudes who sleep in the dust of the earth will awake, some to everlasting life, others to shame and everlasting contempt. Those who are wise will shine like the brightness of the heavens and those who lead many to righteousness, like the stars forever and ever. Verse 4, But you, Daniel, 
close up and seal the words of the scroll until the time of the end. Many will go here and there to increase knowledge. This is very exciting. Portions of the book of Daniel had to be sealed until the time of the end. Does the Bible tell us when to expect the time of the end to begin? Yes, it does. Verses 5 to 9. Then I, Daniel, looked, and there before me stood two others, one on this bank of the river and one on the opposite bank. One of them said to the man clothed in linen, who was above the waters of the river, How long will it be before these astonishing things are fulfilled? The man clothed in linen, who was above the waters of the river, lifted his right hand and his left hand towards heaven. And I heard him swear by him who lives for ever, saying, It will be for a time, times, and half a time. When the power of the holy people has been finally broken, all these things will be completed. I heard, but I did not understand. So I asked, My Lord, what will the outcome of all this be? He replied, Go your way, Daniel, because the words are closed up and sealed until the time of the end. Time of the end equals the end of the 1260 year prophecy. What a fantastic revelation. The Michael who appeared to Daniel also appeared to John. They both saw by God the Father and they both spoke about the time of the end, which is 1798. In Daniel 12, the book is closed. In Revelation 10, the book is opened. Daniel 12, 4, But you, Daniel, close up and seal the words of the scroll until the time of the end. Many will go here and will go there to increase knowledge. Did knowledge concerning the prophetic book of Daniel increase at the arrival of the time of the end, which is 1798? Did people begin to realize the meaning of the fourth beast of Daniel 7? Yes. It's amazing to read about the discoveries made at this very specific time. I did a little research on the theological publications at the time when the Pope was captured in 1798. Suddenly people realized that the prophecy of the 1260 years was fulfilled. Many publications on the prophecies of Daniel were written and scattered all over the world. This generated a tremendous interest in the study of this prophetic end-time book. Daniel 12 verse 7 I heard him swear by him who lives forever, saying, It will be for a time, times and half a time. As we have seen in a previous study, this period began in 538 and ended in 1798. Daniel predicted that certain portions of his prophetic book would be unsealed and would be understood by people at the end of time, which, of course, began in 1798. Michael said that the prophecies would be sealed till the time of the end. In Revelation 10, he appears again and announces the unsealing of the book. How fortunate we are to have an insight into God's marvelous prophecies. And what a solemn thought to know we are living in the time of the end. Let's read Revelation 10, 1 and 2 again. Then I saw another mighty angel coming down from heaven. He was robed in a cloud with a rainbow above his head. His face was like the sun and his legs were like fiery pillars. He was holding a little scroll which lay open in his hand. He planted his right foot on the sea and his left foot on the land. Why did he stand simultaneously on both the land and the sea? The language he employs comes from the fourth commandment, the Sabbath commandment, which identifies Christ as the creator of land and sea. And secondly, his position indicates a message of global dimensions. Let's look at the first aspect of the fourth commandment. Exodus 20 verse 11 For in six days the Lord made the heavens and the earth, the sea and all that is in them. But he rested on the seventh day. Therefore the Lord blessed the Sabbath day and made it holy. God's timing is so perfect. Shortly after 1798, when the time of the end began, the theory of evolution was born. 
And the angel of Revelation 10 points us to the Sabbath command, which says that God made heavens and earth and the sea. He calls us to honor him as the creator by worshiping him on the Sabbath. The mighty angel who instructed John was no less a personage than Jesus Christ. Setting his right foot on the sea and his left upon the dry land shows the part which he is acting in the closing scenes of the great controversy with Satan. This position denotes his supreme power and authority over the whole earth. The controversy has waxed stronger and more determined from age to age and will continue to do so to the concluding scenes when the masterly working of the powers of darkness shall reach their height. Satan, united with evil men, will deceive the whole world and the churches that receive not the love of the truth. But the mighty angel demands attention. He cries with a loud voice. He is to show the power and authority of his voice to those who are united with Satan to oppose the truth. This is staggering. The messages concerning the prophecies of Daniel and Revelation will have a global impact. The nations of the world are going to hear it. The angel's position with one foot on the sea and the other on the land signifies the wide extent of the proclamation of the message. It will cross the broad waters and be proclaimed in other countries, even the entire world. The comprehension of truth, the glad reception of the message, is represented in the eating of the little book. The truth in regard to the time of the advent of our Lord was a precious message to our souls. As we shall see a little later, the message of the little book has to do with Christ's ministry in the sanctuary and after that Christ coming in all his glory. Of course, as you realize, not everything in the book of Daniel was sealed. Tell me which portions of the book were sealed till the time of the end. Daniel 8, 26 and 27 gives us the answer. The vision of the evenings and mornings that has been given you is true. But seal up the vision, for it concerns the distant future. I, Daniel, was exhausted and lay ill for several days. Then I got up and went about the king's business. I was appalled by the vision. It was beyond understanding. The vision that Daniel had to seal up till the time of the end was that of the 2,300 evenings and mornings. It was to span 2,300 years and end in 1844. Only in our day, according to Daniel, would the prophecy be explained. By whom? By God's end-time remnant church. Did you know that the angel of Revelation 10 announces that this would be the very last time prophecy in all the Bible? After 1844, there would be no more time prophecies to be fulfilled. The next great event would be the second coming of Christ. I'm reading verse 6 of chapter 10 of Revelation from the King James Version. And swear by him who liveth forever and ever, who created heaven, and the things that therein are, and the earth, and the things which are therein, that there should be time no longer. Is this literal time or prophetic time? This is prophetic time. We shall notice as we continue that there are still other prophecies that have not been fulfilled, like for instance, the mark of the beast which will be forced upon the whole earth. But they are not coupled to time. The time which the angel declares with a solemn oath is not the end of this world's history, neither of probationary time, but of prophetic time which should precede the advent of our Lord. That is, the people will not have another message upon definite time. After this period of time, reaching from 1842 to 1844, they can the angel of Revelation 10 is Jesus Christ himself. He is coming soon and he wants you and me to prepare for his glorious appearing with all our hearts. Let us not disappoint him. We are living at the end of time. It was in 1844 that Jesus entered the most holy place where the great heavenly judgment is in sitting right now. This is the most solemn period of earth's history. 
Soon he will complete his investigative judgment and then he will bring his reward. The prophet John was invited to come and eat the little book that was in the hand of the angel. Which book was it? It was the book of Daniel with specific references to chapters 8 and 9 which deal with the 2,300 year prophecy in the cleansing of the sanctuary. And as we shall see presently, it had a very interesting effect on John. Revelation 10 verses 8 and 9 The voice that I heard from heaven spoke to me once more. Go, take the scroll that lies open in the hand of the angel who is standing on the sea and on the land. So I went to the angel and asked him to give me the little scroll. He said to me, Take it and eat it. It will turn your stomach sour, but in your mouth it will be as sweet as honey. What does eating the little book, eating the prophecies mean? It seems to me like studying the Bible and assimilating its messages. But let's ask scripture to interpret itself. Ezekiel chapter 3 verses 1 to 3 And he said to me, Son of man, eat what is before you, eat this scroll. Then go and speak to the house of Israel. So I opened my mouth and he gave me the scroll to eat. Then he said to me, Son of man, eat the scroll I'm giving you and fill your stomach with it. So I ate it and it tasted as sweet as honey in my mouth. John is using the same imagery as the prophet Ezekiel. The message I get from these verses is that I must first eat the word of God, making it part of my life before I can preach it to others. Let's ask the prophet Jeremiah to explain his experience of studying the Bible. By the way, he was the man who was put into a pit for prophesying about future calamities. Jeremiah fifteen sixteen. When your words came, I ate them. They were my joy and my heart's delight. For I bear your name, O Lord God Almighty. We will have to eat God's word in order to stay alive spiritually. May I encourage you to have regular spiritual meals from the word of God. Now the portion of Daniel that John had to eat was connected with the prophecy of the 2,300 years. But there is a note of warning. The initial study of this prophecy would bring exceedingly great joy, but afterwards it would bring disappointment. What an interesting prediction. And this is also true in your life and mine. Sweet things at times become bitter. Revelation chapter 10 verses 10 and 11. I took the little scroll from the angel's hand and ate it. It tasted as sweet as honey in my mouth. But when I had eaten it, my stomach turned sour. Then I was told, You must prophesy again about many peoples, nations, languages and kings. As I mentioned before, there was a tremendous worldwide interest in the study of the books of Daniel and Revelations prior to 1798 and subsequently. But these Bible students thought that 1844 would be the time of God's second coming to this planet. In those days, all Bible scholars believed that the cleansing of the sanctuary was the refining of the earth at the second coming of Christ. No wonder they misunderstood this prophecy. I did a little research on this period and made some very interesting discoveries. Do you recognize this name? The Kellogg's family became world famous in a very short space of time. This is the great sanatorium Dr. Kellogg built in Battle Creek, Michigan. In its day, one of the finest in the world. Famous people from all over the world, like Pavlov, came here for medical treatment. I was very interested in the historical cemetery at Battle Creek called Oak Hill. Many of the Bible students who thought and taught that Jesus would come in 1844 were laid to rest in this graveyard. They preached the message of the second coming of Christ with such great conviction that hundreds of thousands of people were converted. One of the greatest of these preachers, a lay Baptist minister, was called William Miller. I found his biography very interesting. These people made a thorough study of the 2,300 years. As far as the first 490 years were concerned, they were 100% correct. But their interpretation of the cleansing of the sanctuary was incorrect. 
In those days, people believed that this planet was the sanctuary and it had to be cleansed at the second coming, as I mentioned before. These Adventist preachers, as they were called, proclaimed with holy zeal that Jesus would come in 1844. And strangely enough, the theologians of the day could not refute their arguments. God was present in this great Advent movement. They quoted Daniel 7.13 to prove their point of the 1844 second coming of Christ, which says, In my vision at night I looked, and there before me was one like a son of man, coming with the clouds of heaven. He approached the Ancient of Days and was led into his presence. The verse does not say that Jesus came to the earth with the clouds of heaven, the angelic host, but that he came to the Father, the Ancient of Days. Somehow God closed their eyes so that they overlooked this very important point. Can you imagine the disappointment of these Adventist preachers when Jesus didn't come in 1844? They were crushed. Uriah Smith was one of the disappointed people who thought Jesus would come in 1844. I also visited his grave at Oak Hill Cemetery. But fortunately, God was part of this great disappointment. And you know what? He wants to be part of your disappointment and mine as well. The angel of Revelation predicted this great disappointment. Why? Because God allowed it for a very special reason. He was preparing an end-time people to grow out of the soil of this great disappointment into the remnant church of Revelation 12 verse 17. Revelation chapter 10 verses 10 and 11. I took the scroll from the angel's hand and ate it. It tasted sweet as honey in my mouth. But when I had eaten it, my stomach turned sour. Then I was told, you must prophesy again about many peoples, nations, languages and kings. What kind of message was it that they had to prophesy again? The sanctuary message of 1844. The whole world must hear the message of Christ in the heavenly sanctuary, interceding for sinners as the great advocate. And what should be the scope of the proclamation of this prophetic message, the judgment hour message? It should go to many peoples, nations, languages and kings. When would this happen? Do we have any indication in the book of Revelation that a judgment hour message would go to the entire world? Yes, let's read it from Revelation chapter 14 verses 6 and 7. Then I saw another angel flying in mid-air. In other words, it's very prominent. And he had the eternal gospel to proclaim to those who live on the earth, to every nation, tribe, language and people. He said in a loud voice, Fear God and give him glory, because the hour of his judgment has come. Worship him who made the springs of water. This is not a physical angel, but an end-time message that would be proclaimed just before Jesus comes again. This is the message that the angel of Revelation told the disappointed preachers to take to many peoples, nations, languages and kings. And right now, while you are listening to this message, you are fulfilling a marvellous prophecy. After the great disappointment of 1844, Bible students had a second look at the sanctuary message. And they discovered their mistake. Jesus was not coming to the earth at that time, but he went into the most holy place in heaven to complete the last phase of his great plan of salvation. While I studied the theological implications of Revelation 10, I discovered a beautiful message. When those early sincere Bible students experienced their greatest disappointment, they received a message from God to prophesy again. They did, and the history of the world was changed. What about your disappointment and mine? Let's arise and proclaim God's good news to the world. Not too far from Jerusalem is a little town called Emmaus. I want to take you there for a very special reason. We are looking for a biblical parallel to the 1844 disappointment. They've built a church on the ancient site to commemorate the story of Cleopas and his friend, two disciples of Christ. 
They believed with all their hearts from the study of the prophecies that Jesus would be the next great ruler of the Jewish nation. But their advent hope was mistaken. One fateful Friday afternoon he was crucified on Calvary. And when he died, all their hopes died with him. And when Jesus was buried in this tomb, their hopes too were buried in the tomb of disappointments and shattered dreams. They spent a very gloomy Sabbath in Jerusalem and returned home to Emmaus on Sunday afternoon. I took this picture at Emmaus to show you the location and the approximate distance from Jerusalem. While they were walking home, a stranger joined them. Let's read the story from the Bible. Luke 24 verses 13 to 18 Now that same day two of them were going to a village called Emmaus, about seven miles, about eleven kilometers from Jerusalem. They were talking with each other about everything that had happened. As they talked and discussed these things with each other, Jesus himself came up and walked along with them. But they were kept from recognizing him. He asked them, What are you discussing together as you walk along? They stood still, their faces downcast. One of them, named Cleopas, asked him, Are you the only one living in Jerusalem who doesn't know the things that have happened there in these days? Verses 19 to 25, What things? he asked. About Jesus of Nazareth, they replied. He was a prophet powerful in word and deed before God and all the people. The chief priests and our rulers handed him over to be sentenced to death, and they crucified him. But we had hoped that he was the one who was going to redeem Israel. And what is more, it is the third day since all this took place. In addition, some of our women amazed us. They went to the tomb early this morning but didn't find his body. They came and told us that they had seen a vision of angels who said he was alive. Then some of our companions went to the tomb and found it just as the woman had said. But him they did not see. He said to them, How foolish you are, and how slow of heart to believe all that the prophets have spoken. Verses 26 to 29 Did not the Christ have to suffer these things and then enter his glory? And beginning with Moses and all the prophets, he explained to them that was said in all the scriptures concerning himself. As they approached the village to which they were going, Jesus acted as if he were going further. But they urged him strongly, Stay with us, for it is nearly evening. The day is almost over. So he went in to stay with them. Verses 30 to 32. When he was at table with them, he took bread, gave thanks, broke it and began to give it to them. Then their eyes were opened and they recognized him, and he disappeared from their sight. They asked each other, Were not our hearts burning within us while he talked with us on the road and opened the scriptures to us? How did Jesus solve their perplexing disappointment? He gave them a Bible study and explained the prophecies of the Old Testament, and one of them was from Daniel 8 and 9, where the exact date and death of the Messiah was predicted. If you suffer from depression, study the prophecies concerning Jesus, our high priest, in the book of Daniel. I looked at this priest at Emmaus and wondered. Maybe he also had hopes, like the two men who lived here some 2,000 years ago. How does he handle his shattered dreams? Does he study the prophecies of Daniel? I thought of the two disappointed men who lived here many years ago. Their disappointment was changed into a heartwarming experience when Jesus explained the prophecies to them. Suddenly they realized that they had made a mistake in their interpretation of the prophecies. Jesus told them that the Messiah first had to suffer before he could enter into his glory. First suffering and then glory. First the disappointment and then the proclamation. I wonder if this younger priest at Emmaus realizes this great truth. The truth that says glory is born out of suffering and disappointment. I left this place at 5.30 as the sun was beginning to set. Wouldn't you like to do what Cleopas and his friend did? 
They invited Jesus into their disappointment and into their home. And their disappointment changed into glory. Please allow him also to change your disappointments into glory. In a future lecture, we're going to see how the 1844 disappointment of the early Adventists culminated in the greatest missionary movement in the history of this planet. The sad 1844 disappointment changed into the joyous loud cry of the first, second and third angels' messages. They proclaim the good news of salvation. They warn that judgment has begun. They solemnly announce the fall of Babylon. They also proclaim the most serious warning in the entire Bible against the reception of the mark of the beast. Thank you, Francois. What a revelation! Our disappointments will change into a joyful occasion when Jesus fulfilled his last promise. One thing is sure, God will never disappoint his children. He is coming again. Let us pray. Thank you, Lord, that although we experience disappointments here on earth, you know all about them, and soon you will change our disappointments into joy. May everyone listening cling to this hope. In Jesus' name, amen.